So it was English privateers who brought the first Africans to Virginia? I've always read that it was Dutch traders who brought the first Africans to the English colony. Right. And part of the reason why there was confusion about the Dutch is because a Dutch man of war was a type of ship. And so when people in the references called it a Dutch man of war, people assumed it was a Dutch vessel. There was also a lot of confusion because these ships were not clearly marked as English ships. They were hiding their identity. And so they were carrying what is called a mark. And these marks were the authority of other entities who were not involved in the Thirty Years' War, such as the Duke of Savoy or William of Orange, who was a Dutch leader. William of Orange was the one who provided a mark to the White Lion. And the Duke of Savoy was the one who gave the mark to the treasurer. But the controversy actually started because the Duke of Savoy actually signed a treaty agreement with Spain, and therefore the mark was removed because he would not participate officially in any privateering operations, especially against any Spanish or Portuguese vessels. And so by the time the treasure arrived, the mark was no longer effective. So that created a lot of controversy. And we would see in the records, even the Virginia company trying to hide the fact that they were engaged in this kind of piracy on the high seas. So this whole story really is a lesson, I think, to all of us that history is often not written in stone, that instead, as you uncover more documents, you dig deeper. For example, historians Linda Haywood and John Thornton went into the Portuguese records to find out a lot more information about who these people were, the fact that they came from the kingdom of Nodongo, that these were people, many of them had already converted to Christianity even before being kidnapped into slavery, that these individuals were urbanites, that they had a life and a culture that was completely separate from what they were forced into once they were forcibly brought here to the Virginia colony. And so history is still really being corrected, but unfortunately, it's taking a little while for everyone else to catch up to this new research that's being conducted now. Speaking of research, it sounds like you've seen a lot of the different historical documents and archaeological artifacts that we have related to these first 20 plus Africans in English North America. And I wonder, given all of the records that you've seen, what does the historical record tell us about who these first Africans were and about their experiences in English North America? Well, the Angela Dig in historic Jamestown is the first time that any of the agencies here in Virginia have actually initiated an archaeological research effort to uncover history of people of African descent. And so this really makes that particular dig significant. And finding out about her would help us to understand whether or not she had any children while she was here about how old she was when she died. It can tell us approximately how many years she was here in the colony. It would tell us about the foods and some of the traditions, any markings or whatever that had religious significance. It would tell us her ethnicity, her specific ethnicity, because the kingdom of Nodongo was an urban environment, you had some other ethnicities living within that particular nation state. And so one of the other things we're finding is that a number of the people who were mentioned later on in the records on the eastern shore, some of those individuals had gained their freedom. In some cases, we know how they gained their freedom. In other cases, we don't know. But they had names, and some of those names were actually Angolan names. And so we know now that there are a lot more people who lived and survived. Some of them became free. We know, for example, all about Anthony and Mary Johnson, who were on the Bennett Plantation. Now, they didn't arrive in 1619. 
He arrived in 1621. I believe she arrived two years later, but they ended up having children. He became a landowner on the Eastern Shore. He did very well. He also is representative of how the laws began to change at that time because they were increasingly more racialized that every time he succeeded and advanced in terms of his status, the laws were changed to ensure that he would never reap the full benefits because he was Black. And we had other people like Antony and Isabella who were located in Kikitan. They were owned by Captain William Tucker. And we know in the records that they had a son that they named after Captain William Tucker. And interestingly, Captain Tucker became the godfather of that son, which meant that the son would be free. So we're in the process of trying to actually, in terms of the records, trace what happened to William and his descendants. Now, there is a family from Hampton known as the Tucker family, and they are saying that they are the descendants of William Tucker. And so it would be interesting to really make those not only the genetic connections, but actually find all of those records, the genealogical records, so that we can actually show the path of this little boy who was born in Virginia and what happened from that point even to the present. 